on to the uh, to the second uh, second talk, well third, including the weird one on Palestine yesterday <laughs> <laughs> of the uh, of the term, which is uh, by Juvan on religion and Marxism. Uh, Juvan will go for about half an hour, forty minutes, uh, and then we'll open it up to, to questions and discussions then. Um, and Juvan will sum up afterwards. Okay, so. Yeah, sure. That one? Yeah, all right. Um, okay, so thank you all for coming, and thank you, Cameron, for that introduction. Um, so the Marxist argument on religion is quite a complicated one. So Marx said that the religious world is but the reflex of the real world. It has no independent history. Religion is simply a um, creation of the productive forces. So, what is religion? So these are a few definitions that we've used in the past. Um, they're not Marxist definitions. So, um, Schleimacher um, defined religion as a feeling of absolute dependence. And Durkheim defined it as a unified system of beliefs and practices relevant to sacred things. So this shows that religion is a system which unites individuals into a community. However, what these definitions fail to take into account is that religion is not something that creates communities, but comes out of them. Um, so religion has long been used to justify the class system, which results in the oppression of different groups, including women, homosexuals, racial others, and poor people. And it fails to acknowledge that society exists first, religion then grows out of the class relations of the society. So this is one um, aspect which religion has um, been very influential in. So in terms of gender, religion has been used for a very long time to oppress women. So, um, I've got a few like, examples. So in Judaism, in the Talmud, um, it states that every Jewish man should wake up in the morning and say, Blessed are you, Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who has not created me a woman, which shows you the extent of how um, important it is to these people to not being women, so being men, essentially. Um, in the Quran it says, men are the protectors and maintainers of women, because Allah has made one of them to excel the other, and because they spend to support them from their means. So this shows that in Islam women are inferior and need the protection of men. Now my example from Christianity is probably my favourite story in the Bible. It's the story of Lot's daughters. Um, so Lot was this man who lived in Sodom, uh, an ancient town in Palestine, Israel, one of the two. Um, it was a terrible town, and so God sent two angels to fix the town, basically. Um, and he sent them to Lot's house, because even though everyone there was evil, Lot was slightly less evil than everyone else. Um, so when the angels got there, the town basically decides that they were going to homosexually rape the angels. And Lot did not want his town to have the reputation of homosexual rapists of angels, so he offers them his virgin daughters. Um, so, firstly, I don't know what the moral of this is. Like, it's better <laughs> to offer your virgin daughters than homosexually rape an angel. Um, and secondly, the story then goes on that the angels destroy the town, Lot and his daughters. Um, run away to, the, to a cave whilst um, his wife is turned into a pillar of salt. So Lot's daughters then get him drunk and rape him and get pregnant. Um, so this story is like relevant to the Marxist argument because it shows how women are seen as um, secondary citizens whose only goal is to produce more laborers and continue the class system. So in Hinduism, the laws of Manu depict women as being entirely subservient to men. 
And the quote is, a girl is governed by her father, a married woman by her husband, a widow by her sons. Now this is interesting because even in a religion like Hinduism where there are millions of female gods, they're still inferior to the men around them. And the um, sort of radical uh, set that grew from Hinduism, Buddhism, um, the Buddha himself argued for gender equality, but later Buddhism has developed to argue that women are lesser beings, and so one key principle of the Buddhist belief system is rebirth, and it's, um, it's basically bad karma if you're born as a woman. If you're born as a woman, that's the same as being born as a monkey. So that shows you the level of oppression that exists within the Buddhist system. And finally, the Sikh example is, um, that's, sorry, the Sikh example is one that uh, goes against the rest of them. So within Sikhism, Guru Nanak has always um, proposed the equality of men and women. So um, the point here is religion can be a force for good, but the majority of the, majority of the time it works to maintain the caste system and carry out oppressions that are required, such as the oppression of women. Women need to be controlled in order to create the next line of workers. Yeah. Okay, so the caste system. Um, so the caste system is a quite complicated concept that comes from South Asia. Um, it's slightly different to class in that with class you can move up and down to a limited extent, with in caste you can only move down. So with caste you can only move down through marriage. So if you are one of the top um, people, so twice born groups, and you marry someone from one of the lower castes, then it's entirely likely that Firstly, both your villages will try to kill you, and then if they don't do that, they will banish you. Um, and then, yeah, you are assigned to the lower caste. So um, this shows that caste is an oppressive system. However, it's not one that actually exists within Hinduism, as in Hindu texts. It's something that came about through the class relations. During the feudal times in India, the landlords and the aristocracy created this idea through the perversion of the Hindu idea of rebirth. So if you were born in a lower caste, you must have done something bad in your past life. So they justified the system through that and it helped reinforce the caste system, which um, again is slightly different, but caste is used to maintain class. Um, so, so the Hinduism as a religion does have potential to be a progressive system, um, but because it is controlled by certain individuals within the uh, system, within society, and those individuals being either the landlords and uh, aristocracy during feudal era or the bourgeoisie now, it's not a progressive system. It's entirely regressive and harmful to many millions of people. Right. so class. So religion is used to maintain class. Religion is a product of the class system and something that um, reinforces the class system. So this quote here, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So on first thought, like when you first look at it, it looks like quite a progressive aspect of Christianity rich people aren't going to get into heaven, being poor is good. But then when you look at it in a deeper sense, it's suggesting that be poor in this life and you reward in the next one. So poor people are happy with where they are because they accept it as God's plan. And since God has a plan for them, it justifies their poor position and they do not seek change. So religion acts to maintain the past system. Um, so, especially in Christianity, which was a revolutionary movement in itself, um, when it was starting to come around in 
uh, about 2,000 years ago. Uh, the Romans referred to it as a movement of women and slaves. So these were the lowest classes of society, and they were the ones that brought about Christianity by following Christ, who was a poor Palestinian hippie. <laughs> Yeah, so the Catholic Church, um, it claims to be the Church of Christ, but it has no um, theological basis. The Catholic Church has basically created a lot of elements in order for its survival. Um, so the, firstly, the divine right of kings, which is not mentioned in the Bible anywhere, was created by the Catholic Church in order to keep European kings subservient to the Pope. Um, and then the idea of the Pope, the Pope is not mentioned in the Bible either. So both of these things completely reject the teachings of Jesus. Jesus himself um, taught people to give away their material goods and live peaceful lives, but the Catholic Church has been involved in a lot of uh, many um, horrendous wars and the Catholic Church is actually worth billions. Um, if you have a couple hundred quid spare, you can actually buy a share within the Catholic Church. <laughs> you can buy shares in the stock market, which is <laughs> ridiculous given how Jesus championed the poor. And these guys are sharing, the, uh, selling their stocks to the billionaires. Um, so yeah, more like sort of examples of systematic oppression within the Catholic Church is child abuse which has been a historic allegation with some concrete evidence in some cases looking a bit less um, likely to be true, but it has existed. And an issue that has exi uh, existed within the Catholic Church, um, mainly in the early modern era, was um, the issue of ties. So this was the idea that you would have to pay mon uh, monks money when you die for them to keep chanting in your name and pray pray for you so that you would go to heaven. Now this is not mentioned in the Bible anywhere. The monks just made this up. And um, yeah, they made a lot of money off it. Um, yeah. Okay, so this leads on nicely to the liberation theology movement of South, uh, Southern America. So this was sort of the fusion between socialist movements and the Catholic Church. It was a bottom-up movement. Um, it was the idea that theology should be approached from the perspective of the poor. Um, so in many ways, it was much closer to the actual teachings of Jesus than uh, what the Catholic Church interprets it as. Um, so obviously, this was opposed by both the Vatican and the USA, since it was a threat to the West, and they moved to destroy these groups. So it was quite an interesting time when you had like priests holding AK-47s and going into war um, in the jungles of Southern America. It, it, yeah. Um, so uh, the, the basic idea behind this was that poverty was the biggest sin. And because local governments weren't doing anything about it, you had to actively get involved and fight for it. So the support for mass movement comes from the socialist side of it, and the um, reason they're doing it is because of the Bible clearly stating that poverty is bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to talk a bit about Gandhi because he's seen as this great religious leader, and um, there are a lot of myths about him that I'd like to expose. Um, so Gandhi did was successful with many of his methods. Um, so he did bring about the end of British rule, although his role is overplayed. Um, so he used religion to justify his methods and name. Um, so he did things like hunger strikes and spinning his own clothes. Um, but one thing that's never spoken about when it comes to Gandhi is he was a racist. Um, Gandhi only wanted equality for some. He did not believe that blacks, South Africans, deserve to be the same as South African Indians and British uh, people there. So he wanted uh, Indian people to be the same as British people, but black people to be uh, treated the same as the untouchables. 
and with the untouchables, uh, or the Dalits, they were the lowest caste within Hindu society, and um, Churchill, who was massively progressive, um, even he managed to realise that this was a problem and that they needed some sort of political um, representation in Parliament, and proposed an act that would create um, positions for members of the untouchables within Indian Parliament. But Gandhi went on a hunger strike to prevent this because he did not want the Dalits to get any sort of power, even though he did dress up like them to show that he was part of the real India, um, which he never was. He was always sort of part of the petty bourgeois. Um, yeah, so. Um, so, religion under capitalism. So, Weber argued that Calvinism created the capitalist ethic. So this was the idea that um, the religion of Cal Calvinism um, had this idea that your life was already predetermined. So when you're born, God already knows whether you're going to heaven or hell. What you do in your life does not matter. Um, so the best way to try and find out whether God liked you was to run a business. If your business was successful, then God liked you. If it wasn't, he doesn't like you. It was quite a weird interpretation of it, but yeah. So the idea was to make as much profit as possible. And Weber argues that this is where the capitalist ethic comes from. Now, this probably isn't true because um, there's a lot of countries that were Calvinist and still haven't developed capitalism. He based it on Scotland, which was one example, and not the rest, basically. Um, but yeah, capitalism under, no, religion under capitalism is less influential than religion under the feudal system. Because under the feudal system, religion played a much bigger role in enforcing the three-stage, uh, the three-class system. Um, but with capitalism, religion does exist uh, to maintain class uh, structures, but to a much smaller extent. For example, less than 50% of the adult British population say they are religious. And is anyone in this room religious? We're just, we, yeah, one person in this room is religious. Um, well, I'm technically religious, so I'm a minister. But, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so religion, religion under capitalism has become much more personal. People put belief in a supernatural being who serves as their saviour and will protect them from the ills of capitalism. If they are still oppressed, so uh, if you're part of what, uh, the poorest or uh, if you've been raped or any of these issues, um, you would see that as God's plan for you and a lot of people don't question it when they really should be. Um, so yeah, so religion is definitely a symptom rather than the disease itself. Um, so religion is much um, changed under capitalism. For example, we have Scientology, which teaches um, their millionaire followers how to um, understand the system of dynamics and how they can overcome it which is basically the idea that we're part of a world that was created by aliens billions of years ago, and they left parts of themselves behind, and we have to get rid of those parts to be pure, and the only way to do that is by buying the, to the next level. So, yeah, in order to be a good Scientologist, you have to be rich, um, which shows the way that religion and capitalism go hand in hand. Okay, so this is probably the most famous Marxist quote on religion. Religion is the sight of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. So religion is, and should be, a personal choice. The state should not move to ban religion at any point. Um, so religion has played a negative role in how it has hidden a lot of the and abuses of capitalism and previous systems. But 
it provides a necessary sort of um, belief to those who need it. A lot of people who live in war zones or live in poverty need something to believe in and they turn to God. Um, so the Marxist argument is that uh, this will not be necessary under socialism because um, you wouldn't be oppressed in the same way. There would be no class system. So all sorts, all forms of institutionalized discrimination would not exist. Another thing that uh, Marxist, another part of the Marxist argument is that it does not matter whether God exists or not. We should be fighting to change the world regardless of whether we believe there is a God. Um, so yeah, so another thing that Marx said was that religion takes our highest ideals and aspiration and alienates us from them, projecting them onto an alien and unknowable being called God. So, um, whether or not God exists, Marx was very clear that socialism should still be the fight. Whether you want to believe in religion once we have socialism is your choice. Um, so, this does not happen under the USSR because um, well, Stalin was uh, a counter-revolutionary, and yeah. Um, so Lenin was always clear that you should always have the right to religion, the right to assemble. Um, religion should be something private, and the state should not get involved. Once he died, Stalin banned religion and um, confiscated all church property, killed anyone who prayed to God. Um, which led to this um, sort of ridiculous image of people who would have to uh, pray to like voters of Stalin, but say the words they would to, as if it was God. Um, yeah, so it was led to like praying underground, which is like ridiculous. Um, yeah. Okay, so in conclusion, religion is a tool used to oppress the masses by the ruling classes. It's not the oppressive system itself. We need to be clear that religion is a symptom rather than a disease. There will be no need for religion under socialism. However, we should not ban religion ever. Religion should be part of free speech, free expression, and it's a democratic right. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so in conclusion, Join the IMT and come to the pub. Thank you. <laughs>